Welcome to BizTax Community Conversation Show. The show is part of our partnership with the Merdeka Award 2022. The Merdeka Award Trust was established by Patronas and Shell in 2007 to recognize and reward excellent individuals and organizations whose works and achievements have not only contributed to the nation's growth, but have also inspired greatness in the people of Malaysia. Now, our guest today is Arimitas Professor Dato Dr. Siti Zuraina Binti Abdul Majid and the Outstanding Scholastic Award recipient for the 2022 Merdeka Awards. Now, Professor Dr. Siti Zuraina won the award for being an outstanding historian and the first ever Malaysian archaeologist that has developed in the field of Malaysian archaeology as well as driving the efforts for Lingong Valley to be recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now, uh, it is with great pleasure. Welcome to the show, uh, Zoraina. Thank you, Brian. Now, Zoraina, for a start, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in archaeology? Um, it's a, it's um, a long journey. I started with Chinese studies and I studied Chinese archaeology. And Chinese archaeology is so fascinating. It's full of all sorts of um, interesting objects that um, had some bearing on uh, Malaysian and Southeast Asian archaeology. So then um, I decided to study uh, archaeology abroad um, with uh, two different professors with two different approaches to archaeology. So I feel I could get a more rounded um, education. Now, um, uh, Professor, if we look at archaeology, we always think of Egypt, we think of Western archaeology, but we don't really think about, uh, and we obviously think of Chinese archaeology, but we don't really think of Southeast Asian and Malaysian archaeology. Tell us how, the, how this sort of evolved and this area of study then expanded. Yeah, you, you know why you think about Egypt? You know why you think about um, uh, China? Because they have beautiful artifacts. They have huge museums. So that has an impact on how we regard um, archaeology. But if you look at time, the largest part of time, 99.9% .9 of time, is a, a period of prehistory where man worked on stone tools, bones, pottery, earthenware. Mm -hmm. Not on Tutankhamun, not mm -hmm. on, you know, um, bronze, uh, bronzes from the Chinese period, no. So uh, I suppose it is unattractive to look at bones, to look at stones, to look at early earthenware. So maybe that's why you don't, um, you, people don't feel um, or don't regard this area as being important. But if you look at the stories, the stones and bones tell you, then you will be impressed. For instance, when man two million years ago was discovered in Africa, how did he disperse all over the world? One route was via Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Okay, he goes down to mainland Southeast Asia, one branch goes up to China, another branch goes down to Indonesia and on to Australia. So um, these are stories that are not as um, attractive and as um, grabbing mm -hmm. as uh, the tombs that you see in China and um, in Egypt. Now, Zoraina, you were a pioneer in Malaysia in terms of archaeology. Um, and, and you mentioned prior to the show that you were the, you started off with a one-person department. When did interest in Malaysian archaeology expand globally? Brian, it wasn't even a department. It was a one-woman show. <laughs> <laughs> and people didn't have confidence in this one woman. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Someone even said if she crossed the road and something happened to her, what happens to all the funding? That we've given her? <laughs> you know? Uh, so it was a tough journey, uh, but uh, we managed to uh, pull it off because I treated it like a mission that I had to do. I had to develop archaeology. I had to have um, the manpower. I had to 
build the next generation of archaeologists and make sure that they are rooted into a center so that archaeology can develop further. There's no point just, you know, um, giving them masters and PhDs and then they, they become um, uh, some, some, they don't become archaeologists. But how has that changed now? You know, what is the faculty size like and, and which is the center of excellence in Malaysia? University Science Malaysia is a center for archaeological research uh, in Malaysia. And um, they focus on the prehistoric period. There's 99.9% .9 of time that man existed on Earth. And, and, and these students, once they've graduated with a, a, a degree or a, a master's degree or a PhD, what do they do after that? I mean, generally, what are the career options open to them? I know people generally think that um, if they have a degree in archaeology, that's the end. They can't get a job easily. But we have to look at it differently. And I think people are looking, employers are looking at it differently today. Um, instead of being uh, going to university for specific training, like being a doctor, being an engineer, or being um, uh, an architect, they go in to, uh, for the training of the mind, logical thinking. And I think archaeology offers them a really rich um, uh, course uh, to look at um, the to look at the world devoid of disciplines. We are multidisciplinary. We are detectives of the past, so we cross disciplinary boundaries, and um, we are just interested in solving problems. We'll use any tool, any scientific tool available. And that's really fascinating because it develops our mind, not just to be logical, systematic, evidential, uh, but it also gives us this concept of time that I think very few disciplines give. We can, in our minds, we can go back to 2 million years ago and we can go to and fro and fit in developments, technological developments or other developments in human um, culture over the period. For instance, um, you look at today, 10 years ago was so long ago in terms of technology, mm -hmm. but to an archaeologist, um, they look at it, okay, we have developed very slowly over time. We develop very, very slowly. There's no difference between 500,000 years, uh, half a million, or uh, 100,000 years um, in terms of technology. Mm -hmm very 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 slow and it gets faster and faster and faster until today last year and today there's a difference absolutely so it gives you that kind of a time dimension technological dimension that i think very few disciplines give you and you know it's interesting that you've just mentioned this if i'm a hr head of a large tech company i think as part of my diversity and inclusion and and getting different uh, uh, streams of thought. I would want to hire some archaeology students. Uh, I think you're very forward thinking HR yeah. and um, you're very intelligent to look at it that way because it's a training of the mind. You want to see what kind of mind that you are getting that can handle all these various issues. Yes. And archaeology is a superb vehicle for that. Because a lot of times, so interestingly enough, why I, I've just come to the conclusion as we've been talking is the fact that if you look to the you to predict the future, you often have to look of lessons from the past, and I think that would be an interesting dimension. Uh, you know, as an employer, I would want to hire these people. Right, right. Now, I want to take a different different approach now and ask you about archaeology and its relevance uh, in a Malaysian context. Now, have you received um, support from? from a corporation, besides the government, of course, which you've mentioned that has been supportive of, of you, have corporations been supportive in terms of helping you in terms of archaeological discoveries within Malaysia? Yeah, I'm happy to say that Petronas uh, was a great help in, um, in um, attracting students uh, to be trained as archaeologists. They were building the gas line from um, from uh, Trunganu down to Johor and uh, Sagamat and up to Bukit Kayu Itam. That took about three years and uh, provided uh, sufficient experience, 
sufficient funding for me to, um, to attract and employ students who are now PhDs, I'm happy to say. I took them in as, you know, first degree chemists, first degree geologists, first degree zoologists, because I wanted a multidisciplinary team. Mm -hmm. So I taught them archaeology and um, uh, they are now uh, the ones, that, the generation that's building it up for the next generation. The funding that Petronas gave didn't just last my time, but you can see the effect and impact for generations to come. Because and there's also something, lies. Professor, that uh, Petronas did in terms of uh, uh, in, in Putrajaya, am I correct? In, in related uh, yes. discoveries. Right. Um, one of the discoveries we made was that along the pipeline was um, a megalith, a, a lot of megaliths in the Grisenby Lan Malacca area. What we did was we um, unearthed the megaliths and Petronas was really, uh, had really, you know, strong sense of social responsibility where they said, no, we don't want those megaliths hidden in a storeroom in a museum. And they said, no, we'll build par a park for it. And they built a park in uh, Putrajaya, the megalith park opposite Shangri-La Hotel. And uh, there we built the story of the megalith to tell the, whoever visits there, what is the megalith? It's not the myth that people know. They say, batuhido, that mm -hmm. means the stone grows, you know, but to tell them what it is and how much we know about it or, and how little or how much more we need to know to study about megaliths. And so really, this is interesting because what it is in my mind is bringing archeology span to the people, making it far more accessible. Yes, yes. Um, I think that was um, very uh, lacking about 40, 50 years ago. But I think now people are more aware, especially with films like Indiana Jones and Tomb Raiders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, they need to know the real archaeologists now. That's um, Hollywood archaeologists. <laughs> yes. They must know exactly what we do, how scientific we have to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, no. Yeah. Professor, you've been, you know, you've made such a contribution to Malaysia and to archaeology uh, as a whole. Who inspired you? Did you have role models previously that inspired you? You know, every woman has a man behind her. It was my late husband. Um, he gave me so, such a long leash, you know do what you want. If you feel that's what you want to do, do it. And I was trained, I was sat at the feet of a very renowned professor. Um, and um, he was a very encouraging man to me. He inspired me. And uh, he gave me what I hold as something very important in archaeology, which is go where the evidence leads you to because archaeology is a field that you have to be very honest, you have to be very ethical, and you have to have an open mind. And that's what I try to instill into the young. Honesty is very important, especially when people don't know much about archaeology. And how do you feel then as you inspire young people? How do you feel about winning the Anugrah Harapan Merdeka Award in your category? Oh, I'm awestruck. <laughs> I'm still, <laughs> I'm still amazed that that's happened because you know, especially for outstanding scholastic uh, achievement, that's the um, the the peak of any academic career. You know, and um, I feel it's also very special because now archaeology is highlighted and I think it's time uh, that uh, people are aware of archaeology um, and that um, archaeology becomes um, a subject matter no longer for that they no longer from movies alone but in real life. <laughs> so professor then looking ahead what are some of your plans um, that you'd like to execute 
in the next couple of years? I would like to see more um, government involvement, uh, more private sector involvement in, um, in, in sending the um, result, research results that we have uh, th that we have that we have had to the public for awareness. For instance, the Langong Valley World Heritage Site. I think there's so much that should be done, could be done, must be done, but it's not done. So if I'm a corporation, I'm wearing, I'm a CEO of a large corporation in Malaysia, what can I do? How can I get involved? You, you said a lot needs to be done. How can I get involved? Tell me what to do. The land matter is a state matter. Mm -hmm. What the place needs is development. And uh, I think um, cooperation with the state is very important mm -hmm. to develop the site, not just for Malaysians, you know. It's a world heritage site. It's for the world. It's for mankind. And yet it's not done. Other countries, you know, vie for this. They do all sorts, you know, in order to get this um, award. World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage inscription. We have it, you know, uh, and we don't um, appreciate it. And Zoraina, I, I, I'm, I'm totally in agreement with you because that's such a special, um, that's such a special site that could be developed, not only for study, for appreciation by the population, not only locally, but 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 obviously from overseas, but obviously the commercial opportunities yes, and development. Yes, yes. Because if you just look at how Penang has developed after right. its World Heritage listing, um, yes. you can see that as long as it's sustainably developed in a responsible manner, exactly, there's a great opportunity for Malaysia there that corporations can get involved in. They can help the local population. Mm -hmm. You know, they can help increase revenue for the country, for the state. But I think what we're lacking is um, looking at things beyond what it is. You know, we don't seem to be able to um, appreciate uh, what we have. I, We've I think got that's a golden a goose that's laid a golden egg, you know. And we don't know how to take advantage of it. Yes. Yes, other countries want the inscription so much because of its economic uh, uh, value. They, it brings in revenue. We can see it, we have figures for it for the world. After three years of being inscribed, it develops, it brings in an income that's manifold. You know, so here it is, do something about it, help the local people. But it has to be, as you said, responsibly developed, you know. Um, there are rules and regulations um, as a World Heritage Site uh, that they will have to use as a guideline. So Raina, this has been a fascinating conversation. I've learned so much and it's been an honor to interview you. But before we leave, uh, are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with? Well, I'm, I, I'm very honored to have this exposure to um, to the world through BizTech. And um, I thank you for having me on your show. Thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show. Um, we've been speaking to Arimitas Professor Dato Dr. Siti Zuraina Binti Abdulmajid, uh, the Outstanding Scholastic Award recipients for the 2022 Modeka Awards. I'm Brian Fernandez on BizTech's Community Conversation Show. This show is part of our partnership with the Merdeka Award 2022. This video and podcast will be on our social media platforms as well as our website, www.biztech.asia. It will also be on our streaming partners, which include TV, radio, and websites. Please subscribe and like our various platforms. Thanks again for tuning in. Mm -hmm.